This is a story that was printed in the Chatham Daily News. The headline reads, Forensic Pathologist Shares Autopsy Results with Jury. Louis the Chopper, Raposo's middle finger, so prominent in many bandito photographs, turned out to be his undoing. How many of you know that bandidos is a motorcycle gang? Yes, all right. Yesterday, a forensic pathologist told the jury at the bandito trial Raposo died after his right middle finger was shot off, shattering the bullet and sending it and bone fragments into his chest. Dr. Toby Rose, medical director of the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service, performed the autopsy on Raposo and three Toronto chapter bandidos whose bodies were found April 8, 2006. Rose gave her opinions and testimony about Raposo, about George the Pony Jessam, James Goldberg Flans, and Polly, the big Polly Sinopoli. The bodies were taken to Toronto for autopsy where the work was divided up. Rose said there was only one case she'd seen in her career where eight bodies were brought for examination from one incident. And it goes on with some detail about the various analyses that she made, the distinction between shotguns, handguns, and the conclusions that she drew from that process. So we're talking about the real CSI here, and our next speaker, Dr. Toby Rose, is the person who does that. How are you? Well, when I tell people that I'm a forensic pathologist, they almost always say, oh, just like on CSI? The good news is, 10 or 15 years ago, they didn't even say that. They mostly said, ooh, that sounds awful. Um, so I have to thank CSI for, for that. But I would like to tell you today about what I do as a forensic pathologist, why it isn't exactly like CSI, but why it is just as interesting. First of all, what is pathology? Pathology is a specialty of medicine, and it is the study of disease and injury. What is forensic pathology? Forensic pathology is a subspecialty of pathology, and it deals with injuries and disease in the human body that in general cause people to die suddenly, and that are often of interest to the legal system as well. So people who die suddenly their cases may undergo inquests or they may arrive in civil court or criminal court. On CSI, all deaths are murders. <laughs> and all deaths have to be investigated by a crime scene examiner or another death investigator. In Ontario, most people die of natural diseases. <laughs> I'm sure that in this room, everybody has at one time or another experienced the death of a family member or a friend, and in almost all of those cases, I would bet that your loved one died of a natural disease, very sadly, and that their family doctor or attending physician filled out the paperwork, and that no investigation needed to be done. That when people die suddenly and unexpectedly, a coroner has to investigate the death. Now, we're lucky to live in Ontario and in Canada because it's a peaceful country, and of the approximately 80,000 deaths that occur in, in a year in Ontario, um, only about 250 altogether across the province are suspicious or homicides. I think everybody's seen the pictures now and gotten the joke. So now I'm going to start comparing what they do on CSI to what I do in my job. On CSI, um, a, a crime scene investigator is involved in all stages of the investigation. They go to the scene, they interrogate the witnesses, and they're involved in prosecuting and jailing um, the assailants eventually. 
Forensic pathologists do one job. Sometimes we do go to the scene, but often we rely on coroners and police officers to do the scene investigation for us. But what we do is do autopsies, otherwise known as post-mortem examinations, and we observe, document, and interpret the findings. Now, we're doctors. And so what we do is just an extension of what doctors do in their offices all, every day. Regular doctors who deal with the living take a history, they do a physical examination, they order various kinds of tests and images, and they come up with a diagnosis. Of course, we can't take a history from the um, person who is involved. So we rely on the scene investigation and we get lots of different kinds of information from police, from coroners, from medical records, from witnesses and from family members. And that is our history. Then we do an autopsy, a post-mortem examination, and I like to consider that the ultimate physical examination. We also order lab investigations and various different kinds of imaging, and we come up with, at the end, our opinion as to the cause of death. Pathologists are doctors who do autopsies or post-mortem examinations, and coroner's cases are ordered by coroners when they do the scene investigation, but they feel that they don't have enough information to fill out the, certi the death certificate. They don't understand exactly why that person died, and so they will order someone like me to, to perform the autopsy. Now, I work with a lot of other people, and I'll just go through a short list of some of the people I work with. Pathologist assistants are probably the most important people I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. They organize the office, they set up uh, the case lists, they make sure that the people who have to come to the cases arrive at the same time, they move the bodies, they collect clothing, other trace evidence, other toxicological specimens, and they help with dissections. Some good forensic uh, pathologist assistants have assisted at thousands of autopsies, and if one of them says to me, here's something I've never seen before, that's worth looking at very, uh, very hard. Forensic odontologists, otherwise known as forensic dentists, sometimes help us with identification of bodies, and forensic anthropologists are experts in bones and can be very uh, helpful when skeletonized bodies are brought into the unit. Now, we work with other professionals as well, scientific and legal professionals, and they include uh, police, prosecuting, and defense attorneys. And we frequently appear in court as expert witnesses, as Moses just, um, as he just read. It's very important then when, that when we go to court, we are not on anybody's side, and that our testimony is fair and balanced, and that we do not take the side of the prosecution or the defense. Uh, here is a colleague of mine, and she's just starting out um, a post-mortem examination, and we consider that there are five stages. The first is to gather the information about the scene and the circumstances of the death. The second part is to perform the external examination, and during that time we can take photographs of the body, we can take any trace evidence, and we can observe the external surface of the body for evidence of injury or disease. The next part is the internal examination, where we routinely look at all of the internal organs, and again, we look for evidence of injury and disease. The next part is collecting the results of the tests we've ordered, x-rays, toxicology, microbiology studies. And then the fifth is sometimes the most difficult. We collect all of the information that we've collected, our notes, the photographs, the results of the tests, and we have to come up with our opinion as to the cause of death. We have to consider any forensic issues that might come up. For example, in a person who's been injured, is there any evidence of what type of weapon might have been used? And then we have to write our report. And that's the last part of the, of the autopsy. Other doctors are not knowledgeable about the changes that occur in dead bodies. 
And this is a photograph that illustrates two of the classical findings in dead bodies. The first is rigor mortis, or post-mortem stiffening of the body, and that's obvious because the left leg of this man is held straight instead of falling onto the table because of gravity. The other change that is illustrated is called liver mortis, or lividity, or post-mortem stating, and that occurs when the blood stops circulating in the body, when the heart stops pumping, blood starts to pool because of gravity, and it, it pools in the lowest areas of the body. And to the uninformed, this can look like bruising, and obviously that would be a very serious misinterpretation. Now, back to CSI. On CSI, the investigators can always determine the cause of death. But forensic pathologists in real life know that there are very many variables that go into the, the, rap, the rapidity of the changes after death. So one of the um, variables that's been studied quite closely is temperature, and that seems quite reasonable. You know the temperature of the body when they die, you know how cold it is in the environment, you should be able to figure out on a curve, on a graph, how long the person's been dead. But of course, we don't know whether the person had a fever or was hypothermic when they died. So we don't even know what the, the first stage of that graph would actually be. And clearly, that would either of those situations would change the calculations quite a bit. Um, uh, some of the other uh, studies that have been done have, been, have dealt with stomach contents and rapidity of decomposition changes, and basically there is no scientific basis that allows us to give a precise time of death. Another problem we sometimes have is uh, distinguishing wounds that occur anti-mortem, that is before death, perimortem, around the time of death, or post-mortem, after the time of death. So there are some characteristics that can help us distinguish these, but they can be subtle, and they're usually they allow us to say things like they look recent or they look old. And it would be very um, wrong, and it could lead to very serious miscarriages of justice if we allowed ourselves to guess or to think that we could be more precise than we can. It is one of the problems with um, testifying in court these days is that we have to work into our testimony somewhere uh, that we know that on television and in fiction, forensic pathologists can do all these things, but in real life we can't, because otherwise the jury is sitting there thinking, well, I saw them do this last night, so why is it that she can't do this? Sometimes bodies arrive in our unit and they haven't been identified at the time. And so one of the um, important things we do is to identify uh, dead bodies. On TV, bodies are always identified by DNA. And I've got these little uh, photographs to illustrate some of the various ways we can identify bodies. Um, in the upper left-hand corner is a dental x-ray and um, our forensic odontologist can compare x-rays of the teeth of the, of the victim with uh, x-rays that were taken by the person's dentist while they were still alive. Uh, DNA is done rarely, but we do have a lab that can do DNA analysis. Many bodies are identified through fingerprints, and some people have unique tattoos. But in fact, the most common method of identification is by visual recognition by somebody who knew the person when they were alive. Now, cases that come into our unit can be divided up into three types. People who die of natural disease, people who die of using drugs or alcohol, and people who die of injury. The problem is, when a case comes in, we can't always tell right away which a group it's going to fall in. So here's a little expansion of that uh, triangle. The most common type of disease that causes people to die suddenly and unexpectedly is various kinds of heart disease, and in our society that would be um, atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. People can die of abuse of alcohol, overuse of medications and illicit drugs, and people can die of 
accidental injuries, injuries that are self-inflicted, or injuries that are inflicted by other people. I'd just like to point out that more men than women have autopsies at our facility, and that's because they are more likely to die of heart, heart disease, and they tend to take part in risky activities more frequently. Now, we do get cases that seem to be suspicious, and often people who, sh who are at our facility have shady backgrounds, and they may have suspicious characters that they associate with. But we have to distinguish between cases that are homicides and, think and cases that are not. The family of this victim has allowed me to, kindly allowed me to present the case, but of course not by identifying him. So I'll just tell you about this case that I had in the last few years. This was a man who lived in a very neat house, and you can see his medicine cabinet on the left and one of his closets on the right. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I suspect um, that he was perhaps obsessive compulsive. <laughs> one day he didn't show up where he was expected, and so family members came to find him, and they found this scene in the basement a pool of blood in the center, broken furniture, including a table and a large broken vase. And when they looked in the nearby bathroom, they found him dead in the shower stall with some wounds to his chest and blood in the shower. And so it was investigated as a homicide. When I did the autopsy, I discovered that these wounds didn't actually go anywhere. They didn't penetrate further than the skin, and they certainly didn't injure any vital organs. So at the end of the third part of the autopsy, I didn't have a cause of death. It was the fourth part of the autopsy that allowed me to make the diagnosis. Uh, the top photograph shows a normal heart under the microscope, and the bottom photograph shows this man's heart, showing a large area of fibrosis and inflammation. Diagnosed, doc, diagnostic of myocarditis, which can cause someone to have a fatal arrhythmia. So what happened? I will just tell you what happened. Um, he went downstairs to undress and shower in the basement, which he invariably did so as not to mess up the rest of the house. He collapsed onto the table, broke the vase, shards of the vase stuck into his chest, and here is a shard with blood on it. He lay unconscious and bleeding on the floor, and then when he woke up, he didn't call 911. Because he was obsessive compulsive, he started to clean up, went into the shower to clean himself up, had another arrhythmia, and died. So there was no more need for police investigation or the justice system to be involved. So just to review, CSI, always homicide, forensic pathologist, lots of different manners of death. CSI helped to catch the bad guys, forensic pathologists are not involved in who done it. CSI, always know the time of death, forensic pathologists understand the variables. CSI... <laughs> That's our real team and the way we are shot at work on the right. They're very, very young. <laughs> it takes a long time to go to medical school and get the training we need. So I only have 10 seconds, but I'm just going to get to the serious part of the talk. Uh, one thing that forensic pathologists also do is we help in other parts of the world where natural or man-made disasters occur. We call this uh, disaster victim identification, and pathologists from our unit have helped in East Timor, they helped after the tsunami, then they helped in Haiti recently. We also train international pathologists from third world countries, and they go back to their countries and help good forensic pathology to be spread around the world. Thank you for having me today.